Chapter twenty seven of the Expedition of the Donner Party and its Tragic Fate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Stewart, Seattle, Washington. The Expedition of the Donner Party and its Tragic Fate by Eliza P. Donner Houghton. Chapter twenty seven. Captain Frisbee, Wedding Festivities, The Masterpiece of Grandma's Youth, Signora Vallejo, Jakey's Return, His Death, A Cherokee Indian Who Had Stood By My Father's Grave. Captain Frisbee spent much time in Sonoma after Company H was disbanded, and observing ones remarked that the attraction was Miss Fanny Vallejo. Yet not until 1851 did the general consent to part with his first-born daughter. Weeks before the marriage, friends began arriving at the bride's home, and large orders came to Grandma for dairy supplies. She anticipated the coming event with interest and pleasure, because the prolonged and brilliant festivities would afford her an opportunity to display her fancy and talent in butter modeling. For the work she did not charge— but simply weighed the butter for the designs and put it into crocks standing in cold water in the adobe stone house where, in the evenings after candlelight, we three gathered. Her implements were a circular hardwood board, a paddle, a set of small, well-pointed sticks, a thin-bladed knife, and squares of white muslin in various degrees of fineness. She talked and modeled, and we, listening, watched the fascinating process saw her take the plastic substance, fashion a duck with ducklings on a pond, a lamb curled up asleep, and a couched lion with shaggy head resting upon his forepaws. We watched her press beads of proper size and color into the eye sockets, skillfully finish the base upon which each figure lay, then twist a lump of butter into a square of fine muslin and deftly squeeze until it crinkled through the meshes in the form of fleece for the lamb's coat then use a different mesh to produce the strands for the lion's mane and the tuft for the end of his tail. In exuberant delight we exclaimed, "'Oh, Grandma, how did you learn to make such wonderful things?' "'I did not learn. It is a gift,' she replied. Then she spoke of her modeling in childhood and her subsequent masterpiece which had won the commendation of Napoleon and Empress Josephine. At that auspicious time she was but eighteen years of age, and second cook in the principal tavern of Neuchâtel, Switzerland. Georgia and I sat entranced, as with animated words and gestures, she pictured the appearance of the buglers and heralds who came weeks in advance to announce the date on which Emperor and Empress would arrive in that town and dine at the tavern. Then the excitement and enthusiastic preparations which followed. She described the consultations between Herr Wirth and Frau Wirthen and their maids, and how finally Marie's butterpiece for the christening feast of the child of the Herr Graf was remembered, and she, the lowly second cook, was told that a corner in the cellar would be set apart for her especial use, and that she should have her evenings to devote to the work, and three groschen, seven and a half cents, added to her week's wages, if she would produce a fitting centerpiece for the Emperor's table. Five consecutive nights she designed and modeled until the watchman's midnight cry drove her from work, and at three o'clock in the morning of the sixth day she finished. And what a centerpiece it was! It required the careful handling of no less than three persons to get it in place on the table, where the emperor might see at a glance the groups of figures along the splendid highway, which was spanned by arches and terminated with a magnificently wrought gateway surmounted by his majesty's coat of arms we scarcely winked as we listened to the rest of the happenings on that memorable day she recounted how she had dropped everything at the sound of martial music and from the tiny open space at the window caught glimpses of the passing pageant of the royal coaches of the maids of honor of josephine in gorgeous attire of the snow-white poodle snuggled close in the empress's arms then she told how she heard a heavy thud by the kitchen fire which made her rush back only to discover that the head cook had fallen to the floor in a faint. 
She gave the quick call which brought the Frau Werthen to the scene of confusion, where, in mute agony, she looked from servant to servant, until, with hands clasped and eyes full of tears, she implored, "'Marie, take the higher place for the day, and with God's help, make no mistake.' Then she went on to say that while the dinner was being served, the Emperor admired the butter piece, and on hearing that it was the work of a young maidservant in the house, commanded that she be brought in to receive commendation of himself and the Empress. Again the Frau Werthen rushed to the kitchen in great excitement, and, knowing that Marie's face was red from the heat of the fire, that she was nervous from added responsibilities, and not dressed for presentation, cried with quivering lips, "'Ah, Marie, the butter piece is so grand it brings us into trouble. The great emperor asks to see thee, and thou must come.' She told how poor, red-faced, bewildered Marie dropped her ladle and stared at the speaker, then rolled down her sleeves while the Frau Werthen tied her own best white apron around her waist, at the same time instructing her in the manner in which she must hold her dress at the sides between thumb and forefinger, and spread the skirt wide in making a low reverential bow. But Marie was so upset that she realized only that her heart was beating like a trip-hammer, and her form shaking like an aspen leaf, while being led before those august personages. Yet after it was all over, she was informed that the Emperor and Empress had spoken kindly to her, and that she herself had made her bow and backed out of the room admirably for one in her position and ought to feel that the great honor conferred upon her had covered with glory all the ills and embarrassments she had suffered. To impress us more fully with the importance of that event, Grandma had Georgia and me stand up on our cellar floor and learn to make that deferential bow, she by turns taking the parts of the Frau Werthen, the Emperor, and the Empress. She now finished her modeling with a dainty centerpiece for the bride's table, and let me go with her when she carried it to the Vallejo mansion. It gave great satisfaction, and while the family and guests were admiring it, Signora Vallejo took me by the hand, saying in her own musical tongue, "'Come, little daughter, and play while you wait.' She led me to a room that had pictures on the walls, and left me surrounded by toys. But I could not play. My eyes wandered about until they became riveted on one corner of the room, where stood a child's crib which looked like gold. Its head and footboards were embellished with figures of angels, and a canopy of lace like a fleecy cloud hovered over them. The bed was white, but the pillows were covered with pink silk and encased in slips of linen lawn exquisite with rare needlework. I touched it before I left the room, wondering what little girl dreamed in that beautiful bed and on the way home Grandma and I discussed all these things. The linen pillow slips were as fine as those Signorita Isabella Fitch showed me when she gave me the few highly prized lessons in simple drawn work, and her cousin Signorita Lise had taught me hemming. These young ladies were related to the Vallejos and also lived in large houses facing the plaza, and were always kind to Georgia and me. In fact, some of my sweetest memories of Sonoma are associated with these three Spanish homes. Their people never asked unfeeling questions, nor repeated harrowing tales, and I did not learn until I was grown that they had been among the large contributors to the fund for the relief of our party. I have a faint recollection of listening to the chimes of the wedding bells, and later of hearing that Captain Frisby had taken his bride away. But that is all, for about that time dear old Jakey returned to us in ill health, and our thoughts and care turned to him. He was so feeble and wasted that Grandma sent for the French physician who had recently come among us. Even he said that he feared that Jakey had stayed away too long. After months of treatment, the doctor shook his head, saying, I have done my best with the medicines at hand. The only thing that remains to be tried is a tea steeped from the nettle root. That may give relief. As soon as we could get ready after the doctor uttered those words, Georgia and I, equipped with hoe, large knife, and basket, were on our way to the Sonoma River. We had a full two miles and a half to walk, but did not mind that, because we were going for something that might take Jakey's pains away. Georgia was to press down the nettle stems with a stick, while I cut them off and hoed up the roots. 
the plants towered luxuriantly above our heads making the task extremely painful no sooner would i commence operations than the branches slipping from under the stick would brush george's face and strike my hands and arms with stinging force and by the time we had secured the required number of roots we were covered with fiery welts we took off our shoes and stockings waded into the stream and bathed our faces hands and arms then rested and ate the lunch we had brought with us as we turned homeward we observed several indians approaching by the bushy path the one in front staggering and his squaw behind making frantic motions to us to hurry over the snake fence near by this we did as speedily as possible and succeeded none too soon for as we reached the ground on the safe side he stopped us and angrily demanded the contents of our basket we opened it and when he saw what it contained he stamped his wabbling foot and motioned us to be off we obeyed with alacrity for it was our first experience with a drunken indian and greatly alarmed us the tea may have eased jakey's pain but it did not accomplish what we had hoped one morning in late summer he asked grandpa to bring a lawyer and witnesses so that he could make his will this request made us all move very quietly and feel very serious after the lawyer went away grandma told us that jakey had willed us each fifty dollars in gold and the rest of his property to grandpa and herself a few weeks later when the sap ceased flowing to the branches of the trees and the yellow leaves were falling we laid jakey beside other friends in the oak grove within sight of our house grandma put on deep mourning but georgia and i had only black sunbonnets which we wore with heartfelt grief the following spring grandpa had the grave enclosed with a white paling and we children planted castilian rose bushes at the head and foot of the mound and carried water to them from the house and in time their branches met and the grave was a bed of fragrant blossoms one day as i was returning from it with my empty pail a tidy black-eyed woman came up to me and said i'm a cherokee indian the wife of one of the three drovers that sold the bruners them longhorn cattle that was delivered the other day i know who you are and if you'll sit on that log by me i'll tell you something we took the seats shaded by the fence and she continued with unmistakable pride i can read and write quite a little and me and the men belong to the same tribe we drove our band of cattle across the plains and over the sierras and have sold them for more than we expected to get we're going back the same road but i first wanted to see you little girls i heard lots about your father's party and how you all suffered in the mountains and that no one seems to remember what became of his body now child i tell the truth i stood by your father's grave and read his name writ on the headboard and come to tell you that he was buried in a long grave near his own camp in the mountains i'm glad at seeing you but i'm going away wishing you wasn't so cut off from your own people so earnest was she that i believed what she told me and was sorry that i could not answer all her questions we parted as most people did in those days feeling that the meeting was good and the parting might be for ever. End of chapter 27 Recorded by Donna Stewart, Seattle, Washington